You're listening to Cloud9, where Bahaiteachings.org interviews artists from around the globe to learn about what inspires, uplifts, and motivates them to make a positive contribution to the world. My name is Shadi Talui Wallace. Alex Fazy Rahani is, to say the least, a man of many talents. Better known as celebrity dentist Dr. Smile, or his stage name, Lex Leo, Alex is also a jeweler, a skater, a fashion designer, and a university lecturer based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Although he has many talents, jobs, and titles, the one that means most to him is that of service to humanity. While maintaining a busy schedule, Alex continues to serve countless children, youth, and adults through various moral development and capacity building initiatives that take place in homes and townships across Johannesburg. A member of the Baha'i faith, he's never shy to acknowledge the origins of his beliefs, motivations, and perspectives with his broad social media fan base. Alex also gets to frequently collaborate with some of Africa's biggest celebrities, who also happen to be his patients, and is known to rap and sing in multiple languages, going as far as creating a new genre of music, which he's dubbed as Afro-Persian. In this episode of Cloud9, Alex and I will discuss how he balances a career with his talents and services to humanity. We'll also reflect on his childhood and learn about what it was like to grow up in a racially divided, segregated society, and how this motivates his work in building racial unity today. Alex, Lex Leo, Dr. Smiles, <laughs> welcome to Cloud9. It's so lovely being um, on this episode with you. Thank you. Thank you. We've been wanting to feature you for a while, so I'm really honored that you accepted this invitation. All in, all in, all in good time. All in good time, right? <laughs> now, I want to start by talking about your upbringing in South Africa. We've already shared or touched on uh, the fact that today you are many things, but I want to go back to a time when you were a young child growing up in apartheid South Africa. As many of us mm. know, South Africa was racially and politically divided between the minority whites and majority blacks until the election of right. Nelson Mandela in 1994. Um, yeah. To many extents, much of this legacy still presides throughout the country today. But since the mid 90s, South Africa has also experienced many victories on the road to reconciliation. So I want to talk about reflecting on your childhood and what you saw around you and how this informs your various paths of service today. All right. So if we look at South Africa now versus then, I think the main difference is that Apartheid, although we say apartheid, it's not apartheid. Uh, it's from the Afrikaans word. But apartheid is just not legal anymore. Um, but the reality, unfortunately, is that it's still very, very prevalent in our society, in our country. Um, sometimes under the carpet, sometimes in plain sight. And that's one thing that makes me really grateful to be a South African, to be born in a society, to be born in a society that is racially segregated, that has so much prejudice, so much injustice, so much um, extremes of wealth and poverty and differences in standard of education, give you an opportunity to serve and help another human being every single minute of every single day. And that's something I'm really grateful for. You know, you, you're not, you, you don't go around blind to the harsh realities um, that are happening right in front of you. And I'm really grateful, I think, to my parents and the principles of the Baha'i faith for making me conscious of those realities, not to cushion and protect and nest us from the reality, rather to make us, con make us conscious of it so that we use our time, our abilities, our talents, our resources to help fight the wrongs and the injustices that have been committed and work towards this this world unity and, and, and world peace that we all so dearly strive for. Mm. You mentioned your parents. Could you share why or how you ended up or they ended up in South Africa? So my parents were both born in Iran. Um, my mother left to the UK when she was very young and my dad moved to Kenya when he was very young. 
they eventually met um, and married in the UK and then came to South Africa with the primary purpose of serving and helping the community develop. And when I say develop, it's not so much an intellectual develop. Uh, it's more uh, spiritually and socially develop. Um, obviously, being somewhere, they came here in, the, in like the height of apartheid. It was, um, it is something that they really saw as priority. Um, they need to come and help a society so segregated um, racially, economically, socially to unite. And they came here with that purpose. And so me growing up with that example of parents who are always giving their time, their effort, their resources, um, their focus to bettering the world around them, um, because that was always my example, it wasn't hard to pick that up. It wasn't hard to start following in their footsteps. Right, right. Now, kind of, I want to talk about your parents and and how they fostered your creativity um, and pursuit for excellence, because it seems like they really did a good job. And it doesn't seem like you've landed on pursuing just one career path today. So as a youth, did you have clarity on what you wanted to be or what you wanted to do Not when you grew all. up? And, and how did your parents? Clarity. <laughs> how did your parents foster um, and nurture your creativity and pursuit for excellence? I know that from a very, very young age, I was very creative. Um, I spent a lot of time in the garden making things. I spent a lot of time drawing. Um, I was very vocal and I was a very inquisitive child. And I think, you know, the part that I remember is that my parents always encouraged me to problem solve and to make the things that I wanted, not to buy the things that I wanted. You know, growing up in a country with such extremes of wealth and poverty, even if we had the money, I didn't even know if we had the money. I wouldn't even know because my parents would have never told me. <laughs> but even if we had the money, my parents wouldn't buy me the toy that I wanted or the new pair of shoes that I wanted or I don't know, whatever brand name t-shirt I wanted. You know, when you're young, you want, you want to fit in by having these things that everyone else at school has. And my parents, I mean, we can take like a pair of shoes, for example. I was in like the top soccer team in like primary school and everyone had new soccer boots. Um, and I wanted, <laughs> my parents are like, no, you can't buy new boots. The person down the road doesn't even have shoes and you want new boots. We'll buy you these, I don't know, generic, whatever, cheapos. And what I ended up doing was I would sit in my room and I would paint and draw on whatever brand name I wanted on those shoes or whatever it was that I couldn't get. Or if I needed a, if I wanted a pair of clothes or a skateboard or something, my parents would rather encourage me to make it. And so I started getting really good with my hands. And then they started encouraging me further that if I wanted something, or I needed to buy something, I had to make a plan to get it. I had to come up with a business idea. Um, I wasn't just handed stuff. And I think even though that was difficult at that age, it really set the foundation for how I think now. The fact that you can't just have just because you want, because of the harsh reality of injustice in our country, made me not only just think of myself and what I need, but focus a lot on others and how I can perhaps get what I want in the process of helping others also grow and advance. One thing, though, that I think is important to say is that when I was in high school, I still had no idea what I wanted to do. I was very involved in like, marketing and advertising companies as a youth. Um, I was really good at art. I was really good at biology and physiology. And so when I finished high school, I was completely confused. I was like, should I become an architect? Should I become a designer? Should I go into business advertising or something in the medical field? And so I took a gap year. I went and did a year of volunteer work. Um, call it a year of service. And I went and gave a year of my time um, to help humanity in some way that that year opened my eyes a lot um again to more of the harsh realities of the world that i wasn't exposed to in south africa i went to greece and i worked with doctors of the world for a year and i was working with the refugees and prisoners of war and um drug addicts and prostitutes and just a lot of like big deal things for a 17 year old to see i think right right um, 
and it really opened my eyes to how important it is for me to choose a career path where I can directly help people. I was like, I need to directly help people. If I go and be an architect, fine. I can go and build a school and it'll take me a few years and then people can learn in it. Great. Or I can make a hospital and people can be like, you know, I was thinking at that type of level. I was like, okay, I go into advertising. I can't really see how I can serve. I can go into art. I can't really see how I can serve directly. I mean, that was my own perhaps ignorance of the, of the beauty of those individual professions and, and how you can serve in them. But at the time I wasn't, I wasn't able to really see the the light and i ended up going in a direction of saying i know that then something in the medical field i can directly help people one by one by one by one with my effort um i didn't really want to do medicine um and i had met this dentist and she was really positive about the career and i was like look i know i'm good with my hands I like to help people. I like to make people smile. I'm good at detail. Everyone needs a dentist. Whether they have teeth or they don't have teeth, they still need a dentist. A country like South Africa um, needs a lot of primary health care. And so I was like, cool, let me apply for dentistry. And so I applied. Um, and the more and more I went through the degree, I realized why I was unique. Um, and why I could contribute something different to the profession. I mean, there's a lot of details behind that, but you, you do anything with a lot of effort, a lot of prayer, a lot of reflection, reflection. And the one, um, thing that my parents told me was if I choose something, I have to stick to it until I finish it. That was the only, um, thing that they told me. They never told me what to study, what degree, what field, nothing. They just said, choose whatever talents you think you have and figure out how you can best help the world. And that's what you should do. And as Baha'is, that's like a moral duty to strive for excellence in all fields of human activity. 100%. These are words of Abdul Baha, the son of Baha. 100%. Yeah. And I mean, that's what's something interesting is that all these different interests that I have, I mean, I've always been interested in them in a different way. But I always say to everyone who asks me about like multiple career paths, how do you choose and what do you do? You have to do first what you know can help the most people. And then once you've done that and you started it, then you can start investigating your other career paths in different levels of focus. So yeah, I've always liked music since I was a very young kid, but I only started investigating it professionally after I graduated. Or I've always liked making things, but I only started doing jewelry three years ago. Mm. Um, or things like this take time because they require a lot of your effort and focus and the foundation may be there in your heart to want to do things, but you've got to, you've got to really put enough into each thing to make it strong and successful. Yeah. So like even my lecturing, you know, I was, I'm still a lecturer at, at one of the main universities in South Africa. And I was like, I cannot be a lecturer if I don't go and study postgrad and do a master's because I wouldn't take myself seriously. If I was a student <laughs> and my lecturer didn't push themselves further. So I went and did a master's degree. And so only again, after my master's, did I actually release my first single. Um, and then the video and the whole Lex Leo journey began now in the last few years, you know? So again, all in good time. Yeah. All with regards to how do you prioritize and envision service or helping others as a part of your different career paths or interests. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. I think, I've experienced it. Many creative people, people out there listening have experienced feeling stuck because they have all of these interests and talents and they don't know how to translate that into some sort of career path or point of action. So thank you. The biggest piece of advice I can give anyone who finds themselves in this type of a situation. So after my first year, um, I had gone to an international Baha'i youth conference in the Czech Republic called Changing Times. So someone like this one gentleman asked me, he's like, so what did you end up choosing to study? And I was like, dentistry. And he's like, what? <laughs> How could you study to be a dentist? Dentistry is so boring. You were supposed to go into like marketing or advertising. And I like broke down into tears. I'm like, oh my God, I chose the right, wrong yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, and then I was speaking to this other lady who was a psychologist and I was speaking to her about this dilemma. I'm like, man, what am I supposed to do? Like, have I, have I chose the wrong degree? Should I quit? Should I go and do something else? And she said to me, it's a very simple sentence. She says, why does it have to be either or? Mm. And so the either or thing, I really, I really like 
encourage a lot of people to try to adopt in their yeah. thinking because it really does help you feel okay. Mm. I mean, you have how many years to live potentially? You can I can still do 10 more professions in my <laughs> lifetime. Well, let's just start by talking about your first profession. <laughs> I want to talk about Dr. Smile. He's quite a prolific and public figure in South yeah. Africa. What's the story behind the name and how did he come to be a celebrity dentist? Okay, so um when I was still in an undergrad capacity studying my uh, dental degree, I was involved, I would say, in the entertainment scene, but in the capacity of a model. So I used to model in my good days. Um, Should have added that to your bio. <laughs> so I used to model, and obviously the modeling industry is very close with the entertainment industry, music industry, et cetera, et cetera. So I think just being out and being at events and being at parties and the circles are quite small. So I had that foundation in terms of socially, as well as some of my friends. Um, then I graduated and obviously in South Africa, after you graduate, you have to do something called community service. So we do one year where we work for the government um, um, and serve the South African community. So I applied to go to a city in South Africa that had no Baha'is um, because I wanted to essentially move to an area because I knew that if there were no Baha'is there, there were no focused children, youth, young adult, old adult community, social, spiritual development programs going on. I know that's one long sentence, but essentially... Um, if you know Baha'is, they're always trying to like help children, help youth, help adults, and help the community that they're in develop, socially, spiritually, economically, morally. And so I was like, look, I need to go somewhere in the country that has no Baha'is so I can start activities there. So I applied to a city called Ladysmith. It's a town, not even a city. Um, and I applied to go into the South African National Defense Force, so the Army. So essentially for that year, I became the army dentist. Um, and I really, really enjoyed the experience. I wanted to go to the army. I wanted to have that experience as well as serve a community that I knew people really um, didn't think the way I did. And on that year, um, I had a lot of free brain time. Remember, I'm finished my degree. There's no exams to study for. There's no tests to study for. You suddenly are getting paid and you have a lot of free time. So my brain had a lot of space to grow. Um, that's where I started teaching myself guitar. That's where the Lex Leo idea started developing. Um, and that's where I started pushing myself in terms of my capacity to help the community with my newfound profession. So I started going to a lot of schools around the area where I stayed. And I started doing free uh, oral health education programs for the children in those areas. And, you know, I'm, because I have this marketing background, I always, I like to think of good names for things. Um, and I was like, look, man, I can't go to the school and these kids are going to call me, hey, Dr. Alexander Rouhani. It's like, it's a bit of a long, um, unfamiliar name. So I came up with the name Dr. Smile. I thought it was appropriate. And it stuck. And as soon as I came up with it, I contacted um, my lawyer in Johannesburg and I got him to trademark it. Um, so the trademark process began. Um, and I started doing that more and more and more community dentistry projects, community dentistry projects. And so that's where I got the name. When I came back to Johannesburg, however, after a year, I started working in private practice. And my friends started coming to me for their teeth, a few of them being celebrities. So again, because of marketing background, I started taking pictures. I was like, cool, let's put a picture up. I'm a new dentist. Uh, let's show people that you came to the dentist. Let's get social media going. And this is when Instagram was like starting. So essentially this idea developed. And, you know, I, once I spot a good idea, I stick with it and I help it develop. And so the Dr. Smile name, my registration came through. So I owned that. I started taking this concept of celebrity dentists because we didn't really have one in South Africa. Um, obviously, we learn a lot of things from overseas. And so I wanted to take that part of the market because I was friends with a lot of the young celebs. A lot of the young radio DJs, TV presenters, actors, actresses, rappers, that was kind of my field. And so I let this thing develop and develop and develop. 
And then so I started doing radio interviews as the radio dentist, and TV interviews as the TV dentist. And so the name just stuck and the brand just stuck. And I've, I've obviously developed it over the years. And how does the fact that you're a public figure impact your role or responsibility as a dentist? It's not something that comes easy. It's not like you can just say, oh, cool, I'm a celebrity dentist and then just chill. You constantly have to push yourself to be better and better. Again, making sure that my academic side, and theory and practical is always on point. You know, it's like I, I treat our top celebrities and I treat the most unknowns. Every single person is a human being, right? Every single person is a soul and deserves treatment. I obviously am one man and I try to do as much as possible but you know with you know this concept of with great power comes great responsibility not that i have great power but i'm saying because i'm in a position that people know i am this dentist it is also my responsibility to, and my responsibility to help individuals um, get their smile back when no one else can that's so special what a, an amazing opportunity to be able to serve in this in this profession and, and this capacity now, I'd love to take this opportunity to segue into your music career. You perform under the name Lex Leo, and you're really making music that is unlike anything I've ever heard before. You jump from English to Persian to what sounds like a few South African languages in a genre that you've created called Afro-Persian. You rap about service, racial unity, gender equality, search for truth, among other topics. Could you share how your faith informs your creative process and how your music and lyrics set you apart from other musicians in South Africa and the world? So Lex Leo started, like I said, officially um, within the last two years. I released my first single uh, titled Bafunu Kwas, which in Isizulu, one of South Africa's official languages, means they want to know. Um, and I released that first single because everyone would always say to me, no, but how come you do this? And why do you do this? And how come you like this? Why are you this type of a person? And all of these questions and like, what's the Baha'i faith? And who are you dating? <laughs> uh, and who's your stylist? And I mean, all these random questions, right? So I was like, cool, I'm going to make a single and a music video that really tells people who I am mm. and what I'm about. <laughs> Can't wait to work with you, big and bass, mix from salad and heat, don't have a seat. You know, people they're always asking me, they're like, Lex, why don't you that Dr. Smile guy? No matter what, you're doing music now. Yeah. And you Persian, eh? Yeah? What's Baha'i? And who you dating? And who dresses you? Oh, I make smiles at Stone Josie For the same kings that run Josie I kiss while I kiss the sky Hendrix vibes love Baha'i All my team gets a slice We shop a seven twice Don't drop out of graduated thrice Our beats my mama Uncle's the egg with And I'm starting from bottom And remember, I am this Persian-blooded kid Who's never been to Iran um, Born and bred in South Africa and I really, I associate a lot more with being African than being Persian. Um, yes, I have the language and yes, I, I have aspects of the culture which I really value. But I mean, I think first and foremost, I was born here and I'm African. And I always look for opportunities in life to break stereotypes, um, to change the narrative. I'm, I'm that type of a person. I like, I look for opportunities to do that. And this is definitely one of them. So I dropped that song and over the last year I've been releasing hip hop because hip hop for me, um, I'm able to tell a great story in hip hop. I'm able to share a lot of my feelings in hip hop. And then simultaneously, I feel that other than it being the coolest genre, it is the most followed by children and youth. And because of that, it is the most damaging to children and youth. So I've been releasing a lot of hip hop and let's say clean hip hop. Um, that still sounds dope enough <laughs> to play on the airwaves. The reason why I'm saying this is because I wanted hip hop to be my foundation because it will really give people a good understanding of what I'm about because I'm able to tell a lot of stories and give a lot of information through that music. Now, this concept of Afro-Persian that you spoke of is something that I started, which is a direct fusion of South African and West African beats, Niger beats, Gom beats. We have, we have a genre of music here called Gom. Gom, Gom, Gom. It's because that's what the speakers do. 
but um it's essentially i'm taking our beats our rhythm our sounds and i'm putting persian lyrics on them i mix english and farsi a little bit because i'm not 100% fluent in farsi but it's good enough for music i think um and that's exactly what i am i am afro persian i am this mix um i have these cultures so what better than to put them into music that i love dancing to you know to be able to use music and you know really really well is really uplifting it's really uniting it has an amazing power to change thought to change action to influence feeling and it's like okay i have a certain responsibility if i'm going to go into this industry and if i have this talent which god has given me well i better use it to help not just use it to i don't know get money and fame because what's the point of that what is the point of us using any of our talents in this life if not to help the world become better you know within south african hip hop what i've been told is that i'm the only artist who doesn't have competition for my content if we look at hip hop everyone's speaking about private jets and cars and mansions and etc 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 not necessarily doing it it's the same thing for me if i'm if i'm speaking about i don't know unity and equality and i don't know education and i'm not actually doing it well i'm as bad as those artists you know it's nothing better and so what i've made sure i do is i really sit and reflect and say okay what am i about what experiences have i had what am i honestly doing or what am i honestly about let me figure out how to put that into hip hop and trap in a way that still sounds dope that has no concept of materialism objectification of women celebration of immorality which hip hop is rife with and let me see let me see as a challenge to myself if i can get this on radio if i can get the youth to dance to it if people can think it's still so cool if there's no swear words in it if there's no i got your girlfriend at the hotel if there's no you know i'm high all the time like i want to see if that is possible because everyone can say yeah that's what's influencing cool but it's causing so much damage at the grassroots level to our children and our youth so this is a constant challenge right this is a constant challenge to take these principles take these beliefs infuse them into music in a creative way it's hard it's hard to sit and write a whole track without saying anything that's so common in hip hop because it sounds dope and that's the challenge then i become a better writer it's easy to write to afro beats without putting in like immorality it's easy to write to house um in my opinion um those things are easy but try it in hip hop it's not easy and 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 nobody want to listen to cheesy hip hop it'll still make cool hip hop it's still <laughs> got to sound like like you know you know what you're talking about or you can flow and i'm trying to be able to influence the children and the youth and i'm succeeding I guess success is subjective but it's working it's working so keep pushing Yeah definitely I think it's also it's spectacular that you've seen a need and you're creating music to address that need but also having these conversations with people and encouraging them to reflect on what they're making and do the same thing You also mentioned your jewelry you're an avid jewelry and fashion designer Your jewelry line is called Shahra Custom Made where you make custom rings, necklaces, earrings and grills. How did you get into this industry and could you share a little bit about how these projects evolved and who you've been collaborating with? Fashion started because I had to make a lot of the clothes that I wanted um from childhood so I always got creative like that and that just developed. And then about 8 years ago I met a fellow Bahai, he's a master tailor, he's from Congo. and we hit it off and we like we're going to design the best suits so we do custom suits for men and women in terms of the jewelry again i'd always made everything with my hands um from dentistry i started uh, making grills because that a lot of the rappers would say to me yo can you make me a grill so I, i taught myself how to do that and that developed and then sounds like yo can you make me a ring can you make me a chain can you make me this and i learn everything like if i don't know it i'll teach myself And so I started Shore Custom Made officially about 3 years ago. It's named after my mother who passed away. Her name was Shore. And um yeah, I make everything, custom jewelry. And for those listening who don't know what grills are, they're jewelry for your teeth. 
Yeah. Is that how grills you would is describe like, it? Grills are like removable gold and diamond. Teeth. Very cool. And you can see that all on, on Instagram under Shohei Custom Made. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so we've talked about your various creative projects, but I really want to talk about your social media presence. I counted and across your three mm-hmm. major Instagram accounts, you've got over 100,000 followers. You've maintained a great deal of transparency and openness, as you've already mentioned, when it comes to your faith on all your accounts and posts. And it seems like you're never shy from bringing it up in your lectures mm. and in your interviews. You also frequently use the hashtag uh, Baha'i and share pictures yeah. and videos from your services in the neighborhood. It's as though you like to take yeah. advantage of every opportunity that you can to link what you're doing to the Baha'i faith, which says a lot about how you value social media as a tool and also the value that you place on your belief in the teachings of Baha'u'llah. What's the feedback been like from, from the followers um, of, your, of your account? I think first and foremost, it must be said that this concept that I have of if you're given something, if you're given something, you better use it usefully. And usefully means use it to help, right? So I don't think I've just been given this ability to have this social media following, which still has a long way to go. Like it's still, it's still, it's still early days. But if I've been given this following, I have a responsibility to the followers. I have to use it for something useful. Um, the Baha'i faith influences my way of life. It influences my thinking, my decisions, my purpose, why I wake up. And that's a really important thing that if there's, if there is this faith that has these teachings that is able to give me so much joy and direction and safety in times of difficulty, why would I not want others to find something like that? And so it is my responsibility to share that in any way I can, because if I don't share that, then what the hell am I doing? What am I doing with all, what's the purpose of social media? If not to try to improve people's lives, social media is just a way of communication. It's a new way of communication. And what are we trying to communicate with people? Are we trying to communicate, um, our good days, our bad days, what's helping us, what's giving us problems, you know? We got to help others. There's so many people out there with issues, with difficulties. If if you can share a little bit of light, share it. One thing that people really value is consistency. There's a lot of people who do community work, I don't know, just for like one day a year or for photos or for the gram or whatever be the case. And then it's not genuine. It doesn't have its intended effect of sharing it. I share the things that I do because I'm always doing them. Um, I try to share them in a way so that people don't feel bad if they're not doing something like that, but feel that they too can do something like that. There's a lot of people who have become part of my activities, my Ruhi um, classes, my spiritual study classes that I facilitate, who have come straight from Instagram. I've never met them in my life. They just um, contact me, DM me. They said they'd really like to be a part of it. I obviously sift through these and see who's serious and who's just taking chances and wants to just meet me for nonsense. Um, and these people have become part of activities. They've stuck by my side. They've become Baha'i. They've started their own activities all through Instagram. So social media has an amazing opportunity to share and inspire. It doesn't come without its tests and its difficulties. Social media is a very like me focused, um, thing and you have to constantly remind yourself that none of your achievements are really because of you they're they're an opportunity that god is giving you um to help others i don't believe that cool i get all these followers it's because of my own great doings it's like okay um god enabled me to do a b and c gave me this opportunity that opportunity this way of thinking so thank you very much now let me use it to contribute So I think if everyone out there is able to figure out how to use their pages to contribute, to share joy, to share light, to inspire, then social media is not a bad thing. If you just use it just to like scroll and see how everyone else's life is better and you feel your life is rubbish and you don't have anything to share, it's really, really dangerous and it can pull you down very quickly. So you have to have a very strong support structure. My support structure is my prayer book. (laughs) And, um, you know, you need something like that. 
but definitely people are, are very scared of social media. They stay away from it because they're like, no, it's too self-centered and this and that. And it can be, but you can use it for amazing yeah. things. So let's do that. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's use things in the right way. Same as music, mm -hmm. right? Music can be used for terrible things and be used for amazing. Yeah, it's a tool. Uh, the eldest son of Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Baha, has said that we must strive for our manners, behavior, conduct, morals, and nature to always reflect the attributes of a Baha'i. Yes. So what sort of example are you hoping to leave for other artists and young people out there who are building a presence on social media? There is one quote that is very special to me. Um, and it says, it's from the Baha'i writings, and it says, if only ye exert the effort. One thing that I try to get across to everyone, to artists, to creatives, to anyone in any profession, is like, all you must do is try your best. You do your best, the rest is in God's hands, right? But what do you do your best in? If you have a talent, do your best, but make sure it's directed to service. Now that you brought up quotes, there's all these quotes in my head. <laughs> There's another, there's another favorite passage from the Baha'i writing that it says, I have no occupation, save mention of thee, and no aspiration, save serving thee. And this is really important to me because it's a constant reminder of why am I here and what am I doing? If I don't constantly push myself to make music that can contribute to the betterment of the world, I may become yeah. very famous with doing other music, but I've lost the purpose. If I'm doing dentistry only because it's just cool to treat all the celebs and do all this cosmetic work and I forget to help those who truly need it most, I'm forgetting the aspect of service. In everything that I do, I've got to constantly remember, even the jewelry. I cannot argue and say that jewelry is serving humanity. No, it's not. It's probably contributing to materialism. But at the moment, I found it to be a way that I can be creative and earn an income and use that money to do things things that money is needed for. If I want to do free treatment, whether I'm buying stationery, whether I'm paying for school fees for individuals or for people to go to university, which is one of my favorite things. My favorite thing is to be able to pay for education for individuals who cannot do it. Mm. Um, this is where the money comes from. So <clears throat> whatever you do, there is a way that it can be used to help the world. Yeah, thank you. That kind of perfectly leads us to our next topic of conversation. We've already kind of touched on the various avenues of service that you're currently involved in already, but I thought we can take some time to talk about them in more detail. I read that you currently have around eight or nine different classes on the go, probably more across Johannesburg. Could you elaborate on these different mm -hmm. avenues of service and how you're helping others realize their own capacity in serving humanity? Okay, so... I currently have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes, I have nine at the moment. Um, some of them have recently finished, and that's <coughs> um, where why my number is at nine at the moment. But it's a good behind number, so it's cool. Um, a big part of helping people is is teaching them how to fish. You know, we know this concept of don't give someone a fish, teach them how to fish, right? Um, a lot of that is helping people realize their own inherent potential and their own capacity to help others. I think this is one of the biggest things. And for Baha'is, the biggest way we can grow and develop spiritually is by helping others. And, and we know that. And so you say, okay, how can I help other people? What help do people need even? What are the problems in our society? What are the solutions to these problems? The Baha'i writings obviously emphasize that so many of the world's social and economic and moral problems have spiritual solutions. And so a lot of the classes that I teach um, deal with how to develop a good spiritual foundation of thinking in the participants. So, for example, I have some classes um, that are for children. And the children are really age three up to nine, ten years old. And these classes deal with giving the children a foundation of understanding what it means to be kind or loving or generous or truthful. Um, 
Right. What does helping others mean? How do you practically do it in your life? How do you even spell the word kindness, first of all? You will teach the kids through games, artworks, drawings, and in my case, a lot of songs. Um, what are these attributes that are so vital in human beings, right? Um, why, is it, why, why is it important to tell the truth or, or to love someone? Um, what is unity even? And, and, you know, how do we... How do we bring that about? So I have these types of classes with children. Um, and that's the grassroots level is the children. Then I have classes with an age group called junior youth. And this is at an age between 11 to 15, 11 to 14. And at this age, there's a lot of tests that come their way, especially from school. There's a lot of questions they have. You know, what do they believe in? Who's God? Where is God? Uh, you know, um, what type of person do I want to be? What path do I take? What job do I want to do when I'm older? And a lot of the classes deal with helping these participants navigate this part and this time of their lives. How to think broad spectrum. How to think for not only you, but for the benefit of those around you. How to choose a direction that is going to contribute to world unity, equality, justice, why you should fight for justice, why you should have confidence in your own abilities. You spend a lot of time enforcing the concept of gender equality into boys and girls so that there's not a situation of, oh, a girl must stay at home and be in the kitchen and a boy must go out and work. And you're trying to break gender roles and stereotypes and that's the age at which to do it. As we get older, you start helping people understand what the soul is, what the purpose of this life is, how they should really use their time. Um, what is, what will get you closer to God? What will take you away from him? Why is there religion? Uh, what religion have you chosen or have you grown up in? Why have you run away from religion? You help people navigate these questions also. And I've found that a lot of this type of discussion um, and guidance really helps bring clarity to people's minds. They then realize they have an amazing potential. They have an ability to help others. They realize their love for helping teach children the same things uh, as I was speaking about. They realize they have a love for bringing people together um, to share prayers. They realize that they too want to help their community in different ways, but don't know how to do it or how to start it. So a lot of these classes help and become stepping stones for individuals to unlock their own talents and abilities. And it has a knock-on effect in their own community because then they start helping, they develop others to help, they develop others to help, and then we change the world. So majority of my time, more than dentistry, more than jewelry, more than fashion, more than music, uh, is devoted to these types of classes. Because, um, again, it's a direct way that I can serve very practically and help the whole community um, and help myself grow also. Um, and so that's very useful or very valuable to me, not useful. I mean, it's useful, but it's very valuable in my, in my timeline. Mm. Well, you've gone into great lengths about talking about your own services to your community, but I want to also reflect on how the combination of all of these service activities shape your own inner spiritual development. So... As I said earlier, the way that you grow is through being tested. Uh, the way you grow is through helping others. What I mean by that is if I'm an impatient person, God is going to send me a situation to test my patience. If I'm not kind, God is going to send me a situation to test my kindness and my generosity, et cetera, et cetera. So what I do is the more and more I expose myself to communities and environments where I need to help others, the faster I am tested. Um, I've definitely been someone who is who likes to actively grow and develop, not passively. So I throw myself into the deep end of a lot of situations and make sure I go into areas that have a lot of difficulties, drugs, crime, crime poverty, prejudice, because, you know, someone's got to do it. So I might as well start. And so the more and more I get into these situations, the more and more I consciously develop my capacity. I have a very, very um, strong relationship with prayer. I love saying prayers. I wish I had more time to say 
prayers for longer, but I don't. I need to make it. But I really love praying. I really love conversations with God. I feel I have this this good relationship with God. He gets me and he's given me so many chances in my life. Um, And I'm just trying to do the best that I can. So it's a consciousness of saying, look, I'm also a human being. I'm also trying. I'm also growing. I'm imperfect in many ways. And I need to work on myself. And the Baha'i writings say, you want to work on yourself? Go and help others. So I've got a lot of work to do on myself. And so I spend a lot of my time helping others. In that process, I grow. Um, And I constantly remind myself that none of my achievements are of my own doing. These are just all opportunities for service that are given to me. And I better not take advantage of them. So it's a consciousness, you know. I try to constantly make sure I don't choose me time over others time a lot of people say to me you know when do i rest or when do i have me time yeah self self care yeah when do i do that and i say look the truth is we are spiritual beings in this material world and if we do believe that then our true being is our soul if i want me time me time means i want to develop my soul if i want to develop my soul i need to give time to others and so that's how i've understood it and so i won't like if i have a gig if I would go to club for a performance, I have an event and it ends at three in the morning, it's my own fault. I still got to wake up at 9 a.m. and go and do my classes with the kids and the youth, you know? It's not an opportunity to say, no, I want to choose that life. Um, I must forsake this. So that's one thing that I've always tried to remind myself of. If I want to do so many things, I must sacrifice perhaps sleep, but not service. So what are your plans for the future and what personal or professional avenues do you hope to explore next cool so in terms of dentistry um i want to continue lecturing in terms of private practice i only want to be in private practice dentistry for the next four or five years max um and so i want to develop a new dr smile who i'm hoping is going to be black female because i need to change the narrative of doctors being Mm. males um, and even non-black males, like I need to help change that. So I'm trying to develop a few young female dentists to be able to take over that slot, which I think will be amazing. Um, I'll continue lecturing and project smile. Um, I'm trying to set up, um, mobile dentistry units because I can do a lot of education and I can do treatment at the practice. But I want to be able to go into these same areas that I teach classes in and once a month just give free dentistry to everyone. So I'm trying to develop to that level um, in terms of Project Smile. Um, I want to, after dentistry, I want to go into a um, field called industrial design um, because I want my design side to develop a little bit more. Um, And I want to create products that can help millions of people at once, not a few people a day. So that's my next actual professional direction. In terms of music, um, I've just released my first mixtape and I will be releasing my second mixtape um, in the next, or well, probably before the end of the year. I'm currently on tour with one of our biggest hip hop artists in the continent. His name is Nasty, it was Nasty C. And I'm really enjoyed touring. We're going to like six cities um, around the country, also going out of the country to perform. And I really enjoy performing. And as a new artist giving this opportunity, I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, at the end of tour, I'll be dropping my second mixtape. It's called The Lex Tape. So everyone better go and listen to that. And then I'm going to be doing a little bit of a tour. I'll do a Lex Tape tour at the beginning of next year. Um, and I'm going to focus on doing that tour in the high schools around the country. Because my hip hop is clean, there's no swear words, there's no objectification of women, there's no drugs and alcohol, and the messages are quite motivational um, in a cool enough way. Um, it's perfect for the high school market. Um, and that's exactly who I want to be able to talk to. Um, so I'm going to be doing that in terms of music and then obviously dropping the new genres. So hopefully the Afro Persian reaches your shores. Um, and I come and perform Absolutely. there one day, Always which welcome. Really yeah, for sure. And, um, yeah, the jewelry is coming to its fourth year. It's growing really strong. Um, 
And these are a lot of my areas of focus at the moment. Now. That's so exciting. I can't wait to, I'm sure our listeners can't wait to follow along this journey of yours. Um, we've unfortunately come to the end of this episode of Cloud9, Bye. Alex. Ah. <laughs> but before we end things, I just want to thank you so much on behalf of Cloud9 and the team at Baha'i Teachings for taking time out of your very busy schedule and spending time with us today. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview and for considering me. I hope somehow this content will help someone. I have someone. no doubt. Absolutely. Um, but thank you. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. And the thank team. Thank you. And all the best with your future projects and services to humanity. Thanks so much for listening to Cloud9. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to check out Bahaiteachings.org where you can find more Baha'i-inspired podcasts, videos, and articles.